The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Swami on May 3rd, 1985 at New Taliban Farm in Carrier, Mississippi. The class begins with a reading from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Leela, Chapter 8, Text 19 and 20. Translation by His Divine Grace Shilavoy Charan Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The great sage Narada said, My dear Maharaj Yudhishthir, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, is always ready to help you. He is your master, guru, god, very dear friend, and head of your family. Yet, sometimes he agrees to act as your servant or order carrier. You are greatly fortunate because this relationship is only possible by bhakti yoga. The Lord can give liberation Mukti, very easily. But he does not give one bhakti yoga because by that process he is bound to the devotee. This passage is a quotation from Srimad Bhagavatam 5.6.18. While Sukadev Goswami was describing the character of Rishabha Deva, he distinguished between bhakti yoga and liberation by reciting this verse. In relation with the Yadus and Pandavas, the Lord acted sometimes as their master, sometimes as their advisor, sometimes as their friend, sometimes as the head of their family, and sometimes even as their servant. Krishna once had to carry out an order of Yudhishthira's by carrying a letter he had written to Duryodhana regarding peace negotiations. Similarly, he became the chariot driver of Arjuna. This illustrates that in Bhakti Yoga there is a relationship established between the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the devotee. Such a relationship is established in the transcendental mellows known as Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhudya. If a devotee wants simple liberation, he gets it very easily from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As confirmed by Vilmangala Thakur, Mukti Swayang Mukulitanjali Sevati Sman. For a devotee, Mukti is not very important because Mukti or salvation is always standing on his doorstep waiting to serve him in some way. A devotee, therefore, must be attracted by the behavior of the inhabitants of Vrindavana who live in relationship with Krishna. The land, water, cows, trees, and flowers serve Krishna in Santa Rasa. Krishna's servants serve Krishna in Dasya Rasa and Krishna's cowherd friends serve him in Sakya Rasa. Similarly, the elderly gopis and gopas serve Krishna as father and mother, uncle and other relatives and the gopis, the young girls, serve Krishna in conjugal love. While executing devotional service, one must be naturally inclined to serve Krishna in one of these transcendental relationships. That is the actual success of life. For a devotee to get liberation is not very difficult. Even one who is unable to establish a relationship can achieve liberation by merging in the Brahman effulgence. This is called Sayujya Mukti. Vaishnavas never accept Sayujya Mukti, although sometimes they accept the other forms of liberation, namely Sarupya, Salokya, Samipya, and Sharshti. A pure devotee, however, does not accept any kind of mukti. He wants only to serve Krishna in a transcendental relationship. This is the perfectional stage of spiritual life. Mayavadi and personalist philosophers desire to merge in the existence of the Brahman effulgence. All of this aspect of liberation is always neglected by devotees. Sri Prabodhananda Saraswati Thakur described describing this kind of mukti, which is called kaivalya, or becoming one with the Supreme, he said kaivalyam narakayate, becoming one with the Supreme 
is as good as going to hell. Therefore, the ideal of Mayavada philosophy, becoming one with the Supreme, is hellish for a devotee. He never accepts it. Mayavadi philosophers do not know that even if they merge in the effulgence of the Supreme, this will not give them ultimate rest. An individual soul cannot live in the Brahman effulgence in a state of inactivity. After some time, he must desire to be active. However, since he is not related with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and therefore has no spiritual activity, he must come down for further activities in this material world. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam 10 Because Mayavadi philosophers have no information regarding the transcendental service of the Lord, even after attaining liberation from material activities and merging in the Brahman effulgence, they must come down again to this material world to open hospitals or schools or perform similar philanthropic activities. Thus in the Bhaktivedanta translation purport of the Chaitanya Charitamrita verse Adilila chapter 8 text 19 quoted from the Srimad Bhagavatam 5618. So actually what's being explained here summarized in the previous verse also. Krishna Jadi Chute Bhakti Bhakti Mukti Diya Kabu Prema Bhakti Na Denara Ken Lukaya and if a devotee, translation, if a devotee wants material sense gratification or liberation from the Lord, Krishna immediately delivers it, but pure devotional service he keeps hidden. In discussing the qualities of Krishna, and later it will describe the qualities of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We should understand that just as any person even, I mean, a material person in this world has got different moods, different ways of dealing. It's like someone who's a judge, when he's in his office chamber, he has one way of dealing. When he's on the dais and the, uh, and the what is it called, the, the stand or in the courtroom, on his, uh, whatever it is, elevated seat, then he has another very formal demeanor. When he's at home with his uh, family, he has one way of dealing. When he's with his old old uh, friends from the Moose Club or whatever, they, you know, some, he has another way of dealing. And each particular circumstance, he has a, a different way of dealing. And you'll see him in a different uh, mood, in a different uh, attitude. Although he's one person. So the Lord being unlimited, He has unlimited qualities and unlimited aspects. And for each aspect, He also has an unlimited form. He has another form. So that, of course, in each, in, in each form, He has so many qualities. But then for one particular type of activity, He, uh, <coughs> he manifests and often a, a different form, uh, specifically which uh, embodies more that particular uh, type of, act, uh, of activity. And uh, Narayana is very majestic, formal kind of aspect. Krishna is the very intimate aspect. Lord Rama is a type of more intimate yet kingly aspect. And like that, there are so many different uh, forms. Narasimha, Buraha, Kurma, Matsya, and so on. There are literally uh, unlimited uh, expansions of the Lord in different uh, forms and shapes. And so slightly different mood and flavor is also there. Of all those, Krishna, of course, is the fountain head of all the uh, forms of the Lord. Yet, compared to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there is a difference in terms of giving His mercy. We should understand that just as a person in a material world is a reflection, it's like considered to be a dim reflection of the Lord. Because we are a part, just like if you take a part of the ocean, 
that also will be salty. The whole ocean is salty. Of course, within the ocean there are elephant. I mean, rather whales and so so many uh, other types of sharks and fishes and things like that, where you, you won't find many whales in one drop of the ocean. So the ocean has got few more characteristics than a drop, but whatever characteristics a drop has, the ocean also has. So whatever qualities we have, Krishna has those qualities. He's not less than we are. But he has even some more than we do. That is the basic understanding. There was once a great, uh, there was once a, a, a person, a great devotee, or a sage of one type, I forget exactly his name. And he was in difficulty, some kind of trouble. And so then he called out, God, Lord, and so there are many lords, not just one. And then, at so that time, Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Lord Vishnu, all three of them came because, well, they're all three are lords of the universe in different aspects. And they said, "You called. Which one did you call?" <laughs> and so then he said, "Well, all three." <laughs> He didn't know exactly what to say. So then, uh, anyway, he got out of his difficulty. But like Gajendra, when he called, he said, the Supreme God, the Param Lord, the, super, the Supreme Lord. So then Vishnu himself came, because oh, of the three, although they're all lords, but he's the Supreme. So like that, there are different names. So if we just use a different names, each has a certain meaning. Like in English, the word God, exactly... If you look in the dictionary, what does God mean? Kind of a vague term. It's like you saw, say someone, Mr., to call the Supreme Personality of Godhead as God. It's kind of a very vague, it's like saying Mr. to a person. It's, it's kind of just a vague term. It doesn't really indicate too much. God says the Creator. Well, even Lord Brahma was a Creator, but he's a secondary Creator. And you have to say the Supreme Creator, or if you say the original. It's a kind of a vague term, but generally speaking, it probably would direct energy or a prayer towards Lord Vishnu, because he's the Supreme Controller. But it uh, addresses primarily Vishnu in the material universe, because it's a kind of a term which is relating with the Lord of the material universe. Well, but the original personality of God had existed before the creation and he exists after the annihilation. He's not dependent upon the material world for his existence. Rather, the material world is a temporary manifestation of his internal potency. So, in Sanskrit, they also have a word like God that's called Ishwar. It means the controller. So then they have the word Param Ishwar means supreme controller. Just like they have Brahma means transcendental. They say Param Brahma means the supreme transcendental. Chaitana, Chaitanas means conscious and Chaitanana means the supreme conscious entity. So in the Vedas you find there are different names for different personalities of the absolute truth. So when you come to the Samambona, then there are names which cannot identify anyone else. There's no vagary about it. There's no uh, discrepancy. So such terms such as Govinda or Krishna, Rama, these are names which directly address the Supreme Personality of Godhead in one of his more intimate aspects. So Krishna is even more compassionate in his uh, when he's directly addressed his original form is more compassionate than uh, to the other forms who are supervising the material world. He gives liberation very easily. He gives material benediction also very easily. But even Krishna is a bit reluctant to give his own pure devotional service. If you totally surrender to him, then he... Uh, may give you uh, his pure devotional service. If you get the special de mercy of some devotee or something. So this is something to know. I mean, often, of course, 
Everyone generally in this world prays to the Supreme Lord for material sense uh, gratification, or if they're a little more spiritual, they ask for salvation. You see, right? Are you been saved? Bathe in the blood, be saved. But here, we find that what is considered to be the highest, even in most contemporary religions, to be saved is described here as good as going to hell. If to a pure devotee, if he's not able to serve the Lord, that if they're able to continue serving the Lord, they, in other words, they achieve such a nectarine taste for devotional service that they would rather, you see, they would consider achieving some kind of salvation without devotional service as good as going to hell. They don't want any form of liberation which would interfere with their devotional service. If salvation on its own comes and it doesn't interfere, if it's one of the types of uh, liberation which doesn't interfere, well then they might tolerate it. But they don't have any separate desire except for serving the Lord in loving devotion. So that type of uh, relationship with the Lord is described here, that why the Lord is very reserved, why Krishna is very reserved in giving that type of benediction, is because if he gives some, just like someone comes to the boss, they give me a bonus. They give him a bonus, so that's finished. He already says, come and give me retirement. Not ready to give him retirement with a pension. He's finished, he's set up. But if he come and said, adopt me as your son, he'd say, <laughs> wait a minute, you know. <laughs> Then they have to give the Gemini a whole inheritance, and the relations, it's, you know, it's a whole different thing. You come to Krishna and you actually become his pure devotee. You become uh, connected and related with him in pure de- loving devotion. Then he becomes personally involved with that devotee. And that means that he becomes obliged in so many ways. Of course, he's always independent and you can't hold him to any obligation, but out of his own unlimited causeless qualities, he often agrees to just accept that type of position as if he were obliged, just out of some relationship of love, he reciprocates. Because the devotee depends on him like that, he also puts himself in the hands of his devotee. So, he's very conservative when it comes to giving that kind of benediction. That's the nature of Lord Krishna. Now, in regard to Lord Chaitanya, Krishna Das Kaviraj explains, Hello Prima Shri Chaitanya Dila Jata Tota Jagai Madhai Parjanto Neraka Kota Translation, Lord Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has freely given this love of Krishna everywhere and everywhere anywhere, even to the most fallen, such as Jagai and Madhai. What then to speak of those who are already pious and elevated? That's not me. That's not me. Translation with repetition. Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has freely given this love of Krishna everywhere and anywhere, even to the most fallen such as Jagai and Madhai. What then to speak of those who are already pious and elevated? Purport. The distinction between Sri Chaitanya, the distinction between Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's gift to human society and the gifts of others is that whereas so-called philanthropic and humanitarian workers have given some relief to human society as far as the body is concerned, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offers the best facilities for going back home, back to Godhead, with love of Godhead. If one seriously makes a comparative study of the two gifts, certainly, if he is at all sober, 
he will have to give the greatest credit to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It was for this purpose that Kaviraj Goswami said, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Doya Koroho Bichar Bichar Kodile Chitte Pave Chamotkar Quote, If you are, give to His Grace, if you are, 173, if you are indeed interested in logic and argument, kindly apply it to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If you do so, you will find it to be strikingly wonderful. Sri Narottam Das Thakur says, Dina hina jato chilo hari name udhari lo Tasha ki jagai madhai The activities of such persons have now become common practices. It is no longer considered abominable to be a drunkard, woman hunter, meat eater, thief, or rogue. For these elements have been, have been assimilated by human society. That does not mean, however, that the abominable qualities of such persons will help free human society from the clutches of life. Rather, they will entangle, entangle humanity more and more, reaction to the stringent laws of material nature. Once an activity is all performed under the influence of the modes of material nature, property, free money, unai, money, because people are now associated with the modes of ignorance, tamabu, and to some extent, passion, rajabu, with no trace of goodness, sattvabu, they are becoming increasingly greedy and lusty, for that is the effect of associating with these modes. By associating with the two lower qualities of the material nature, one becomes lusty and greedy. Actually, in modern human society, everyone is greedy and lusty, and therefore the only means for deliverance is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement, which can promote all the Jarkais and Madhais to the topmost position of Sattva Guru of the medical culture. Srimad Bhagavatam states, Nasta Prayeshu Bhattreshu Nityam Bhagavatase Vaya Bhagavatya Tumaslokye Bhakti Bhagavati Nashtiki Dara Jastamo Bhava Nama Lubai Vayaschaye Considering the chaotic condition of the human society, if one actually wants peace and tranquility, one must take to the Krishna consciousness movement and engage always in Bhagavad Dharma. Engagement in Bhagavad Dharma dissipates all ignorance and passion. When ignorance and passion are dissipated, one is freed from greed and lust. When freed from greed and lust, one becomes dominically qualified. When a dominically qualified person makes further advancement, he becomes situated on the Vaishnava platform. It is only on this Vaishnava platform that it is possible to awaken one's dormant love of God in. As soon as one does so, his life is successful. At present, human society is specifically cultivating the mode of ignorance, tamadu, although there may also be some symptoms of passion, rajagri, full of kama and loba, lust and greed. The entire population of the world consists mostly of sugars and a few vices, and gradually it is becoming and gradually it is coming about that there are sudras only. Communism is a movement of sudras. Capitalism is meant for vaishas. And the fighting between these two factions, the sudras and vaishas, gradually due to the abominable condition of society, the communists will emerge triumphant. And as soon as this takes place, 
whatever is left of society should be growing. The only possible remedy, remedy that can counteract the tendency toward communism is the Krishna consciousness movement, which can give even communists the real idea of communist society. According to the doctrine of communism, the state should be the proprietor of everything. But the Krishna consciousness movement, expanding the same idea, accepts God as the proprietor of everything. People can't understand this because they have no sense of God. But the Krishna consciousness movement can help them to understand God and to understand that everything belongs to God. Since everything is the property of God and all living entities, not only human beings, but even animals, birds, plants, and so on, are children of God. Everyone has the right, everyone has the right to live at the cost of God with consciousness. This is the sum and substance of the Krishna consciousness movement. Srila Prabhupada in, in Mayapur Dham, once he was addressing, and he said especially he was looking towards his Western and specifically his American followers to stem the advancement of materialism, of uh, rather godlinessness, and thus to counteract the type of atheistic communism in the world. He pointed out that actually the atheistic communists are 100% atheists, but even the capitalists, so there, by that definition, according to the Vedas, anyone who doesn't believe in Vishnu or God, the Supreme Lord, is an asura or a demon. He said, of course, that even in a capitalistic society, you got about 80 or maybe 90 or some very high percentage of people who in a real in-depth way, they're also living, in, uh, they don't believe uh, deeply in the existence of the personality of Godhead. Therefore, they also are acting practically as uh, dem demons. But still there's a semblance or there's a basic... Uh, acceptance of uh, godliness. And so actually, if the fight is not made, a fight between two different political systems of communism or capitalism, because both of them have got their innate defects, but if it's rather made, if it's polarized on the basis of godliness and atheism, then uh, by that, the world would actually be benefited and then the capitalist or whoever is on the side of godly, God consciousness, they would naturally, they'd be able to become victorious. I've seen in the third world, for instance, like in South America or other places, because uh, capitalists are painted as very big demons in those poor countries. And... Uh, you find that even some of these priests, they take up the position of the so-called liberation on the material platform, even though they're decried by the Pope and others. But uh, because the whole situation is very confused, they're able to convince the common people to go on the side of this type of communism. But actually the common people are very godly. In their own way, they have a lot of faith for the Lord. But because the whole issue is very confused, they're misled. And then eventually they also become godless if they become, you know, totally converted to that ideology. So the actual necessity is not to push the different ideologies, but to actually push God consciousness. And automatically, of course, those uh, automatically this godless uh, communism would have to go either for a more godly form of capitalism or for a type of transcendental Varnashram situation. But in any case, godless uh, society wouldn't be able to stand. And that is the biggest danger. When the people become totally godless, then naturally they lose all their good qualities and everything becomes a mess. Just like because there, there's a semblance of... Uh, uh, <clears throat> 
some moral, ethical, religious standard in the West so we can still practice Krishna consciousness openly. That freedom is there. But uh, we don't have that freedom in the Eastern Bloc to practice openly because their state ideology is atheism. That uh, previous uh, premiers have stated that they were against Krishna conscious movement because they said it was non-sectarian. They said that Krishna conscious movement is not meant simply for the Christians or for the Muslims or for the Jews or for the Hindus, that it's for everyone and that they say that everything is the property of God, not the property of the state. Therefore, they're the number one enemies of our class struggle. They said that these people have to be stopped at all costs. So they didn't say that the number one problem is capitalism. They got, they got that. They're going to wipe out the capitalists if things go on the way they are. They're losing their propaganda war to America. If you, anyone who neutrally sees how things are going, one by one countries are falling because people, they don't have what they need in their heart and their, and so it's very easy to, to get people to be envious and look at those people have, but they're not able to do anything for you. Therefore, they're the fault. And someone else who's cutting their profile to look at, we, we follow the system that all people, it's all equal, nobody, everyone gets the same. There's no, although it's not actually that way in practice, but in terms of propaganda, naturally someone who is really, uh, in a difficult situation, it's very easy to instill enviousness in them if they're not very uh, godly. But when you break it down to belief in principles which are based on God consciousness, then people immediately, the, the, the pious people of the world, they, they become polarized and they can say, yes, yeah, so, well, naturally we prefer godly rather than atheistic principles. Atheism is pushed in the background in their propaganda later on is brought up as they get absolute control. Just like in, uh, what is that country? In uh, the, the president just died a few days ago. Albany? Albania? Is Albania European? Is Albania? It's Albania. Albania. They've, uh, they just, they just, they just bulldozed down all the churches and mosques. They've, they made religion totally illegal. Death sentence, if you say, if you profess in God. And they just took all the people, anyone that had a name like Peter or Allah or Muhammad, they just changed their name and made it all some kind of neutral name. No name that would remind anyone of anything religious. And that's, that's ultimately what will happen if God consciousness is not preserved. The only reason that it's allowed at all, even in name in some of these countries, is just for the PR. That if they totally banned it like Albania, Albania's not worried about outside PR. But if Russia were to do that, then naturally a lot of these uh, Latin American other countries where the people are still basically pious, they believe in God, then naturally it would polarize things and then people would become inimical. So they have to keep on the front. They say there's freedom of religion when actually all the priests are members of the party. <laughs> and there's, there's hardly any mention of God. So anyway, the, the need uh, for the Krishna conscious movement, of course, is to preserve consciousness on, a, on real levels of, of uh, transcendental science, of, of, of God, of the Supreme Personality. People, they need to have scientific knowledge. So Lord Chaitanya, he's actually giving not only knowledge of God, but he's giving love for God. He's giving that which is very difficult to achieve. He gives it very easily, without even any uh, restriction. Whether a person is uh, very pious, or even if a person had, had all type of bad habits, somehow or another, if we take up Chanting of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adwaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakti Vrinda. We participate in Lord Chaitanya's uh, authorized activities, then spontaneously people become uh, lovers of God. This is it's natural because it's natural that we, we were always were, but it's been covered up by these uh, material contaminations. And Lord Chaitanya's benediction of those coverings are removed by chanting of these holy names. 
and by practicing of Krishna consciousness. So, as a result, that which normally may take births and births, what to speak of years and years, it, it may take so long. It is, he can take forever. He may not achieve that, uh, that kind of a benediction. It's something that's uh, very special. Even the Lord himself tends to give salvation and shies away from giving. When he came, the Lord, when he came as a devotee, the devotee is naturally the representative of the Lord's mercy. So when the Lord took on the mood of a devotee, then also he took on that kind of mercy. But because he's the Lord himself, he's got his giving mercy. Is different. When, of course, the devotee prays to the Lord, please have mercy on these uh, people, then... The Lord hears their prayer, but when the Lord himself is taking the part of a devotee, there's no question about hearing anyone's prayer. When he gives his mercy, it's immediate. It's, he's, got the, he's got the absolute power to do that. He doesn't have to go through any red tape. If he wants to give someone love for Krishna, being Krishna himself, in the, that particular mood, where he stops distinguishing who's qualified, who's unqualified, what are the consequences, what will be the obligation. He's just giving that mercy in a very liberal mood. That is just like everyone has a mood. So that's the mood of the Lord when he's just in, it's called adhorja, when he's just in that mood that let me just give freely charity to everyone without distinguishing that who should get it, who shouldn't get it. Just like sometimes, what is it? Mr. Millionaire or something, they used to go and deliver checks in the, and just walk up and hand people a million dollar check and see what happens. Even he probably, I know, that was like a TV show when I was a child, I don't know what... Sure, they don't have those things anymore. But anyway, that mood is there that sometimes people just want to give charity to everyone without any uh, restriction. Everyone invited, come and get it type of thing. Well, uh, that because Krishna also has that quality and the personification of that quality is Lord Chaitanya, that he is giving the most valuable thing, just come and take it. Of course, most people are so proud that even they hear, they can't believe it. They don't, just like if somebody advertised that everyone come, I'm giving away, you know, million dollar diamonds to whoever wants it, probably a lot of people wouldn't even bother to come, they figure it's just a joke. Nobody gives away such a valuable thing. If a person actually shows up, maybe only a few people would come just to see, well, you got nothing to lose. And uh, so although Lord Chaitanya is giving the most valuable thing, people, they're not, uh, they're not uh, generally even aware of the value of what he's giving. They generally think that, uh, they don't really understand what is the value of love for Godhead, or even what it is. It's just a, it's just a name. It's just something that they've heard about, but Nobody's really seen it much in practice, so nor had it very explained very clearly. And <clears throat> what to speak of get it or even think about getting it. So when actually it's offered, then of course people, only very few rare people are able to get it. But therefore those who do get it, then naturally they think, how can we somehow another we, we give this to others? This is like, you know, naturally if there's a big sale going on, you want to tell all your friends, this is a good opportunity, come and buy the things. You know, if you know if you have an insight uh, on something. So here's an insight. Somehow or another, the devotees uh, get it, and they just want to inform the others. But it's so confidential that if you just go and tell people, well, they don't even they won't even comprehend what you're talking about. So even just to bring them to the point where they can understand what's actually in the offering, what's available, that may take a very gradual cultivation just for a person to really understand what is available. Somehow or another, usually we just get people to chant Hare Krishna even without telling them. They themselves say, well, this is fantastic. I never felt so wonderful. What is, the, what is this all about? What does this mean? Why am I feeling so peaceful? Why am I becoming uh, relieved from all my... Then you start to explain and they... Prabhupada explains sometimes you give the kids the dessert first because they're not uh, sober enough to take the whole meal. They just want to first dig into the apple pie with the ice cream and everything at the end to go through the spinach and the uh, other preps, preparations. They're not that patient. So practically the people of Kali Yuga, they're not so patient to go through and understand all the points first. But once they get a sweet taste, then they become a little bit 
interested in finding out what it's all about. It's kind of the mentality that people have. So, and these, of course, are very long purports, but I was going to shorten them, but they were so nectarine. Prabhupada explained these various points in such great detail that didn't seem appropriate at all to edit anything out, even just for the sake of maybe we would have covered more verses and more pastimes. But these are so important points to understand. They're so esoteric that, uh, well, even if we spend a little more time on it, there's no loss. Rather, we have everything to gain. If we understand how fortunate we are to get the uh, mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to be able to uh, chant his name and to practice the teachings which he's given, that this is a very rare coming. There are many, many predictions of how the Lord would come in this uh, disguised way and that his purpose uh, would be multifold. Externally would be to deliver the people and to give this uh, process of devotional service and chanting the holy names. And internally there are some other purposes also, one of which is his own curiosity that all the time he's the Lord and everyone serving him and some of his devotees when they serve him they become so ecstatic and love for him. And he, of course from his point of view he doesn't really exactly understand what they're experiencing. He can see that they're very ecstatic. Sometimes his devotees appear more ecstatic to him than even he is to accept their service. So as a type of transcendental experiment, you can say he wanted to see things from the point of view of being a devotee. And to do that, then he had to change his attitude and his whole frame of reference. And so then he expand, he, he joined together with uh, his greatest devotee. And he took on this form of Lord Chaitanya to be able to experience what it was like to be a devotee of himself. So that's a pretty esoteric understanding and generally speaking people don't even understand anything about God, what to speak about something as uh, intimate as that. So these things are discussed in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. That's why this book is considered to be postgraduate study. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita which tells about what is the material world, what are the three modes of nature, what is the individual soul, what is the... like that. And then the Srimad Bhagavatam discusses a little bit about what is Krishna. Bhagavad Gita also tells us. But then the Srimad Bhagavatam in detail tells us about Krishna and the soul and the relationship between the individual soul and Krishna, devotional service. And, of course relatively what is the material world at a much higher level. And then this tells us even this Chaitanya Charamita is like postgraduate. This already going into some very intimate uh, understanding of the Lord's personality and especially of course about his coming as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and how we can achieve the highest benediction by his mercy. There have been many saints, many great prophets and comings of the Lord in different uh, times and places. And some of them have offered great benedictions and showed miracles and even given salvation from the material world. But all of them say that, of course, the highest perfection is to have love for Godhead. But how to get love for Godhead, that, there's no easy way given if any way is given at all, there's no easy way, really clear way, explained. But here Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, without any ado, he just gives, he just giving it away. For those who chant this uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in his footsteps, that is the miracle of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. So we're trying to encourage people to study the Bhagavad Gita, to chant Hare Krishna, knowing that 
All these processes are recommended by Lord Chaitanya and the devotees have this inner understanding of Lord Chaitanya's actual position. Immediately it's difficult to tell people of Lord Chaitanya's position because for them to get a proper grasp of it, they'd have to know what is Krishna's position, what is their position as an individual eternal spirit soul. What is the position of the material world? I mean, these things are not understood by modern man. They don't have a clear spiritual conception of life. Therefore, it's necessary to read the Bhagavad Gita, to study the Srimad Bhagavatam, and gradually they could come up to the level of understanding Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because it's Lord Chaitanya's 500th anniversary this year, coming out in 1986, uh, March 20, in March. So just to focus on Lord Chaitanya's advent and on his uh, spiritual position during this time. So we're discussing a little more in detail this year about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If somebody can understand even a fraction of what Lord Chaitanya is giving, as it says here, that then one will be filled with uh, wonder. What was the exact? Shri Krishna Chaitanya Doya Koroho Bichar Bichar Koride Chitte Pave Chamotkar If you are indeed interested in logic and argument, kindly apply it to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If you do so, you will find it to be strikingly wonderful. In other words, if you try to give the award, who was the most magne- uh, munificent person in the history of mankind? Then you start to analyze, well, this person, he gave everything for his family, or this person gave everything for his country, or this person gave everything for humanity, or this one gave different type of benediction. Like this you can analyze But then if you start to analyze it, what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives, what he's given, then if someone really analyzes it and then starts to understand what are the relative implications of one thing or the next, they, they become, become strikingly wonderful that what he's giving is... Uh, beyond any comparison. If somebody would go into it and actually just try, all right, where's the best deal available? If somebody really took the time and went into it, what's the, who was the most munificent person? You see, well, the Guinness Book of Records wouldn't, don't have that spiritual vision, but uh, if they could have the patience going into it, then they'd probably have to give the record to Lord Chaitanya. That would be their, he doesn't need it from them, but it would be their benediction. The point is that somehow or another, if somebody is able to get their mercy or understand, well, they're very fortunate. So those who have understood, naturally they'd like to introduce this to as many people as they can by whatever means is possible so that people can take advantage of the opportunity, because it's not going to be here forever. And specifically, it's more available to human beings. A lot of the people in this world, they may take birth in their next life, even as animals, the way they're headed. They took a Gallup poll of some sort, some kind of a poll in Europe, what would you like to be in your next life? Most of the people wanted to be one form or another of animal. I think in France, most of the women wanted to be cats. And most of the men wanted to be dogs. It was it Italy or somewhere? Some of the women wanted to become snakes. I don't know why. And some of the men wanted to become horses. So I mean, Mother Nature can fulfill their needs. They can take uh, reincarnation in those forms. And people, because they think, oh, to be an animal is free. In Japan at the World's Fair, where I just visited, to get some ideas for our Chaitanya world, which you want to construct at Mayapur, the Oriental people, especially the Japanese, they really worship, kind of, they admire birds. And panda bears and birds are very, they like nature, they're real nature lovers. So they worship the birds and how the birds are free and 
they can fly and eventually men will be like that. This is, of course, you see the actual birds, they're like, they just they have to work so hard to fly. And after all, I mean, if that's their desire, of course, they could become birds. But actually being a bird and having to go around all the time looking, I mean, the geese have to fly all the way from uh, from Canada just to get a good uh, fish dinner. They have to fly all the way down to New Orleans and Florida to go to the bayous and the Everglades. I mean, <laughs> that's uh, supposed to be the freedom. doesn't sound very free. It's pretty much under the modes. But that's the kind of a very sentimental outlook people take where they don't really have an understanding. Once they take birth as a bird, of course, if they had the recollection of what it was like to be a human, they'd probably consider that being a human being is a lot better than being a bird. <laughs> <laughs>